Uh, I answer the phone. Uh, hi, it's Loz. The research that I do is mainly sponsored by your tax dollars, by the Australian Government, our National Health and Medical Research Council. Uh, I also have research currently that's funded by state governments, including Victoria, uh, and the governments overseas. And then a lot of the work that we do is of, of great interest to insurance companies, uh, because when you have pain and you uh, cannot work, that costs insurance companies a lot of real dollars. And, and they're just realising that probably 40 to 50% of income protection insurance claims are because people have pain. Uh, and they have pain resulting from soft tissue injuries that are considered non-catastrophic. So uh, many of you will identify with this. Uh, some of you will have more substantial injuries. But the really costly ones for insurers uh, in terms of their bottom line uh, back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, neck pain. Uh, and on the global burden of disease, this is something you touched on, Rob, uh, there is nothing more burdensome on the planet as term, in terms of years lived with disability and economic cost than low back pain, uh, followed by depression, followed by neck pain, uh, and musculoskeletal disorders. So three out of the top four health conditions. Cancer comes in at about 14, and diabetes somewhere around there as well. So it, it's a really massive issue. And what we do know from pain science, and I'll get to this by the end of my talk, uh, is that there is, a, there is a great hope now, based on the revolution in pain science and how we understand these things, that that burden, which is big on a society level, clearly, but it's really big on an individual level, and many of you will, will be aware of it on that level. There's, really, there's real hope that we can start turning that around. Uh, but you're the key to turning that around. So I've got a few messages that I'd like to get across, and I'm going to guess uh, how long it's going to take me. I sort of will depend on how distracted I get with stories, but I'll do my very best. I think this is a really important issue. Criti uh, pain is a critical lifesaver. I went to school with this guy uh, who used to charge $5. Now, when I went to school, $5 was quite a lot of money, primary school, $5 for us to jump on his hand. Uh, now, in my, in my memory, I thought, oh, wouldn't that just be cool to have the gift of being able to have someone jump on your hand and it not hurt, and it didn't hurt him and he could swap hands. But his hands were clearly being injured by this. And I was one of the people that paid the five bucks and I saved up. <laughs> and I put a phone book on top of the chair that I stood on, just so I'd get a bit higher. <laughs> and now when I think, I, he, he died when he was 23, that fellow, because he was born without critical part of physiology, which is the ability of his tissues to detect danger. We call those things nociceptors. Now, his nociceptors or danger receptors were faulty. They, they didn't work. And there are a few uh, famous cases that, that have stayed alive through really incredible vigilance on behalf of their parents and, and on behalf of themselves. But even looking at them, they don't look right because they've had so many injuries and because danger detectors don't just tell us about danger. Danger detectors, the activity of danger detectors is critical for normal tissue health, normal growth. Things grow in the right way, in the right shape, if your danger detectors are working. You need a lot of other things as well, but, but danger detectors working. And then a side point of that is having a bit of pain is critical for development. It's critical for no normal functioning. And, and this mate of mine who I thought, oh, wouldn't that be great? He died because he didn't have these receptors working properly. So pain is a, it's a critical giver of life. It's just like a loyal and faithful companion that will, will bring into your awareness the possibility that you are in danger and you should do something about this. Uh, raise your hand if you have ever had pain. Raise your hand if, if you have been aware at any time in your life of that pain being quite helpful to get you out of a potentially dangerous situation. Great. 
Now, you don't have to raise your hand for this, but have, an answer, have a think about this question. What if that pain st started to prevent you from doing things that you actually probably knew were good for you? And trying to overcome that barrier. Two week weekends ago, uh, I had a massive flare-up in a spondyloarthropathy, which is a, an autoimmune disease that I have, and it's very well managed, and two weeks ago it went nuts. And there was I knowing the best thing for me to do is to, is to move. But it was so painful to get onto my bike, I ride a bike a lot, that I fell over trying to do it because my system was in this competition of worlds. Produce pain. You are in danger. And cognitively, but I think this is good for me. And this is a real challenge that all of you face. Uh, and I think will get easier the more you understand. The more you understand. And that's the thing that really gets me excited about my work. That we know understanding helps. We want pain to be like a faithful and loyal companion that protects you when you need protecting. The problem that we hit is that the relationship between pain and injury is a very variable relationship. We know that different people have different pain thresholds, uh, and, and I know there's a few clinicians in the room, but for those of you who are patients, I'll let you in on a secret, that if you tell your clinician you have a high pain threshold, <laughs> they tend to think you don't. <laughs> so don't tell them that, even if it's true, don't tell them that. You look them in the eye and say, what do you think about my pain threshold? So get them answering. This relationship between pain and injury is highly fascinating. And uh, I had a neurology professor when I was doing my physiotherapy degree a long time ago, who said when we were leaving the lecture theatre once, he said, and you know, young man, the worst injuries are often the least painful. And I said, no, that can't be true. Because we have pain receptors and... Pain is damage. And he said, well, why don't you go and find out? So this is exactly what I did. I went to Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, Sydney's biggest hospital, and I took a clipboard. And on my clipboard, I wrote down a data collection form. So one column, I got to describe the injury. In the next column, I got to describe how much they were writhing in pain. The next column would be how gory the injury was. And the last column was the answer to the question, on a scale of 0 to 10, and how sick are you of this question? On a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being no pain, 10 being worst possible pain, how would you rate your pain right now? <laughs> Who feels like even the, even the sound of that makes you want to adopt the fuck off posture? <laughs> yeah, I know, we, we can't help ourselves. Can you rate it? I remember one, one dude in particular coming into the uh, emergency room that day. I sat there all day. And I was alerted by his weird voice because he said, no way, Giorgio. And there was this guy who was walking in to casualty department like this. And he's saying, no way, Giorgio. And he was doing that because he had a hammer stuck in his neck. Oh. Right, you know the curly bit that uh, you're meant to get the nails out with? That had gone in the back of his neck and it was coming out the front. And there was blood all over him. And, and I was in third year training. So I'd already had some clinical training. So I said, there's a hammer in your neck, mate. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I know. <laughs> Completely relaxed. So how do we make sense of that severe injury and apparently no pain? The way I thought at the time was he's clearly had something. Like he's clearly had pethidine or morphine or something. So I asked him, have you had anything? He said, what do you mean? Well, have you taken anything? Yeah, yeah, I have. Oh, well, that, that would be it. What have you had? Well, it's a kilometre from the building site and I was getting a bit peckish. I stopped for an <laughs> egg and bacon roll. <laughs> Isn't that outstanding? Imagine going into the cafe. Oh... Uh, Giorgio, do you want, look, just two egg and bacon rolls, thanks. <laughs> he's had no drugs. This guy has no drugs in his system. But he's got severe injury and he doesn't seem to have any pain. So my next conclusion is he is probably just uh, a complete idiot. 
his brain is not capable of making his body hurt. But then, after I've been talking to him for 30 seconds, filling out my form on a scale of zero to 10, <laughs> zero, he said. And he said, oh, I've got this gag. Ready? And this is what he did in a crowded casualty waiting room. He did this. He said, what am I? <laughs> and he was going between the sta- the, the, all the seats and he got up. And I said, mate, you are a nutter. <laughs> and he said, no, no, I'll do it again. Giorgio, do the sound effects. So he did it again. And Giorgio, who wasn't coping very well, actually, <laughs> he was sort of a big giggly. And uh, Giorgio did this. This guy got up the second time and said, I'm a hammerhead shark. (laughs) And I thought then, he and he's planned it, he's planned the joke, he's told the story really well, he's choreographed it with Giorgio, he's clearly not a moron. His brain is very capable of working. So I've ruled out a drug. I've ruled out a brain that doesn't work. So I have to conclude at that stage of my career and understanding, and you might relate to this, I had to conclude it's shock. Uh, we would call that stress-induced analgesia. So the, the brain is just not letting any, and in the old way of thinking, we would say the brain's not letting any pain messages in. Do you relate to that? I see a few nods. Well, if that's the case, how do you explain what happened next? Where he has to turn around and he hits his knee on a little coffee table thing (laughs) with magazines on it. He's got a hammer in his neck. And he did this. Oh, yeah, oh. And the nurse ran over saying, my God, my God, look at your neck. And there's a guy with a hammer in his neck screaming at the nurse, it's my knee, you idiot. Same human, same moment in time, severe injury, no pain, mild injury, pain. Just think through that. Same human, same time, severe injury, no pain, mild injury, severe pain. How on earth do we make sense of that if pain equals injury? And my response to that scenario was, all right, I've got to find out. That was 25 years ago, or a bit longer. How fascinating is that, and how difficult does that make our life if we're treating people in pain, but more so if we have pain that we don't understand? Really, really difficult. So how does the system actually make this sort of thing happen? Well, we've had a a massive revolution, really, in our understanding of what pain is. Uh, René Descartes, who was a philosopher in the 17th century and who was really, really clever, and about whom I wrote a song and sang with my kids when they were little little kids, it goes like this. René Descartes was very, very smart, which is why we sing this song. But I must impart, he was a jolly old fart. And as it turns out, he was wrong. (laughs) And once I was singing that with my two-year-old son at the time, and he managed to fart on cue. <laughs> and you know, as a parent, when, when you, your child's done something that you know you shouldn't really encourage, but you're really impressed by it. <laughs> and I eventually had to say, oh, good on you, Henry. That was a, Henry's not his real name. No, it is. Um, <laughs> Rene Descartes had this idea that really pain was something that would be detected in the tissues of the body and sent to the brain. So that you get a marker of the state of your tissues. So so you're being told how are your tissues. And this is what it feels like. And this is the, the most common interpretation of pain still. But the last 50 years of scientific progress tell us it's not like that. Pain doesn't work like that. And this is both a really confronting reality, but a really exciting proposition if you have pain. Pain is all about protecting our body tissues. 
It's all about making us do something to get out of pain. And it's a brain thing. Which means we can now understand and explain findings like this, that in violinists, fingers on their left hand are more sensitive than fingers on their right hand. To painful stimuli. To stimuli that could be painful, you don't need as big a stimulus for this hand as you do for this one. Why? Because you have to protect this one more than this one to play the violin. This is a more important part of your body than this hand. Makes sense now. It doesn't make sense if pain is measuring tissue damage or state of the tissues. It makes sense if pain is a protective feeling that we get. And I could throw you examples like that from research experiments I've been involved with or, or collaborators or people I've never heard of have undertaken. And we would be here for a week with the amount of data that support that idea. And this summarises it. Anything that suggests you need protecting takes pain up. Anything. Anything that suggests you don't takes pain down. You were talking about the hot water springs at your place. Who else just imagined themselves in one of those warm water baths <laughs> as you're talking? That sends a good safety message. That data, the whole, all of the data coming in, suggests that you are in less danger. Therefore, it should reduce pain. Now, I don't know if there's any randomised controlled trials that are able to blind people for whether they're, you know, make people unaware of whether they're in the warm bath or not. That would be pretty hard to do. <laughs> but as a scientist, that's what we need for evidence. But as a basic scientist trying to understand how does the human work, that would be my prediction. Because that, those stimuli suggest you don't need protecting as much, so pain should go down. Have you ever thought about this? So remember back when you twisted your ankle, because nearly everyone twists their ankle. In fact, raise your hand if you have ever twisted your ankle. Great. In fact, it's probably more interesting just for the... Raise your hand if you've never twisted your ankle. Never. Congrats. It's not... You're pretty special, right? Right, raise your hand if you have twisted your ankle and you sort of liked the experience of just how swollen it got. <laughs> it gets really swollen. What's amazing about twisted ankles is that they stop hurting a long time before the, the ankle is returned to normal. The ankle will take normally six or eight weeks, maybe longer, for the tissues to be back at peak condition. But most twisted ankles stop hurting a long time before that because they don't, their system doesn't need to produce pain to stop them doing stuff. So there's no point in producing pain. Pain is about protection. You could do this experiment. Why don't you do a little experiment here? We'll see if we can make this work, but, but if anyone has an injury doing this, please sue Musculoskeletal Australia <laughs> or the sponsors. Okay, so what I want you to do is just uh, squeeze your, your thumbnail, one hand on the other. Don't do this if you have sore fingers. But squeeze it just enough just to make it hurt just a little bit. Remember how hard you're squeezing it? Okay, now squeeze the thumbnail of the person next to you, the same hardness. <laughs> and what you should all notice is that it hurts more when they squeeze it. So we, <laughs> okay, stop now. <laughs> when I, um, I once ran this experiment, I once ran this experiment squeezing earlobes. <laughs> and that was bad because they came back a week later and half of the class had bruised earlobes. <laughs> it's a bad look. But... We do a controlled experiments which show that if you apply pressure to your own finger uh, to produce pain of a, that you rate at about 3 out of 10, uh, if, you apply, if someone else who is your friend is applying that same pressure, even though they're your friend, it hurts more. And if it's a stranger, it hurts in, almost intolerably and people will swear it's more pressure. 
that bastard is turning up the pressure. <laughs> so the difference in these scenarios is not the event, it's the risk. And the risk is what determines how, your, your, it tells your brain, okay, I need you to protect yourself here. And the only way I can make you protect yourself here is to make it hurt, because it, it's unpleasant, pain is unpleasant. You want, you want to stop it. Many back pains, I think the evidence would suggest most back pains, uh, that can be brutally painful. Pass out, painful. Frozen, lying on the ground, painful. Distressing, painful. Distressing for the people around you, painful. Something you rate at 9 or 10 out of uh, 10 might be associated with little or no injury. We now know that. The data tell us that. It feels like you've been blown apart. Some back pains that have proper tissue damage and some significant injury feel just the same. Life-threatening injuries, where your life is at risk because of this injury, are usually pain-free. Think through that. So I'm talking here about a, a, a limb being blown off, catastrophic trauma, uh, and most of you will at least know of a story, you might know someone, you might, it might have been your story, that at the time of injury for, really, for until you were safe, you were pain-free. Once your, your life is no longer under threat, then you normally have a lot of pain. Because pain is not measuring tissues, it's telling you whether or not you should protect. And the brain is smart enough to know that if, you, if, if it creates an experience that makes you look after your arm that's been blown off, then you'll die. So it doesn't create that experience. It's a very, very sophisticated and cool system. So we now conceptualise pain as something that provides for us a protective buffer. Uh, I remember putting up a slide a bit like this for a talk in France uh, and they said we don't have the word buffer. It was being translated in real time. And the translator said to me, I'm sorry, we don't have a word for buffer. Unless you mean buffer. <laughs> and I said, well, what does buffer mean? And she said, well, it's the, uh, the, the protective layer outside of a car to protect the car. from." And then as she was talking, she was saying, that's what you're saying, isn't it? Buffer. I say, no, no, I'm not saying buffer. I'm saying buffer. <laughs> so pain provides a protective buffer. And the size of that protective buffer varies all the time according to anything. Anything related to protection. So you could either spend the next 20 years of your life getting your head around all the experiments on pain. Or you could just remember that principle and apply it. So if you have knee pain and you're an otherwise normal human and you're participating in a research experiment in, uh, in one of our research programs and we took you to a set of stairs You've got knee pain, this is important. And we just asked you, uh, we're going to walk up those stairs, how many stairs do you think there, there are there? And you had a guess at that. You would guess more stairs than if we walked up and said, we're not going to walk up them, but how many stairs do you think are there? And you guess there's fewer stairs. Because even without you knowing it, your brain's already trying to discourage you from, from going through a painful situation. So your brain tells you there's more stairs than there are. But this will only happen if you're human. <laughs> if you're not human, it won't apply to you. So what, what are the important factors that determine the size of the buffer, that protective buffer? Danger messages from the body are really important. We have danger detectors through all of our tissues, and you can activate those danger detectors by squeezing tissue or by heating it or by freezing it or by putting too much acid in the tissues, if you like. 
And that's detected by things that we call danger detectors. And danger detectors send a, a really, really uh, important message. Now, I, I've got to try and read what this said. Oh, I met someone twice this, uh, today before the talk. Uh, um, I'm looking for you, but I can't see you, but there. <laughs> twice in one night. And what he uh, observed about me made me wonder whether or not I should tell this, this story. Can you raise your hand if you've seen a YouTube uh, TEDx talk where I talked about walking in the bush? <laughs> if you haven't seen it, go and have a look at it. I'm going to miss that story. Is that all right? Did anyone come just for that story? <laughs> okay, if I've, got, if I've got time at the end, I will, but I suspect that I won't. What's more important than danger messages coming from the tissues of the body is what your brain thinks those danger messages mean. And that's a, that's a really important reality. That, that you might need danger messages coming from the tissues of the body to be alerted to an event. But what your brain thinks those messages mean are, is more important. Now, we would hope that if those danger messages are being triggered by a dangerous situation, we would hope that the brain concludes, yes, this is a dangerous situation and you need protecting. And that is normally what happens. But have a think about this reality and then have a think about your back scan report. Has so anyone had a, uh, an X-ray, a CAT scan or, a, or an MRI on their spine? Raise your hand. Okay, so maybe... Half of you, a bit more. Uh, you, you probably got the report that's in an envelope that says confidential, only to be opened by your doctor, and you opened it. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. And then you read it. And it says things like degeneration. It says things like you have a broad-based disc bulge pressing on your faecal sac. And you might not necessarily know what a faecal sac is, I had a patient who described it once as a faecal sac, which <laughs> is not quite right, but... The, what information you get from the report changes what this, this, this danger messages mean. So we've just finished a, an experiment with 400 people that shows that if we give them their report and we explain that those things mean normal age-related adaptations, they have less pain when they bend over than if we don't explain that. So the danger message from the body is critical, but what it means is more critical. If you've had knee, knee x-rays, if you like, and someone has made the mistake of saying to you, it's bone on bone in there, <laughs> that says danger. That's, that's a critical determinant of meaning. So I would, I would suggest to all of the health professionals I ever come in contact with, it, unless it is bone on bone in there, which you probably really need to go in with an arthroscope to have a look, and it's almost certainly not the case, don't say it, because it looks like it on an x-ray. Pain is not the only thing. So, so all of our things that we experience are determined by meaning because the brain is creating these things. And I always use these slides, and I know some of you who have seen uh, that TED Talk probably know this, but uh, go with it, all right, because half of you haven't seen it. But just raise your hand if you think the square that's got A in it is darker than the square that's got B in it. Okay, great. If you, if you really don't see it like that, you've got a neurological deficit. <laughs> so you, your brain's not working properly. You should see this as darker than this. Uh, but if we take those out to the side, you'll see hopefully they're actually exactly the same. But your brain is changing the data for you based on what the whole package means together. And you can see this for yourself. One of the amazing things about this is what happens when you turn your head on your side. So turn your head right. Or don't, if you've got sore neck, don't do this. Don't hit heads. <laughs> Careful. If you get your head right over, right on the side, and your eyes vertically aligned, 
it still looks exactly the same. <laughs> so if you... <laughs> If you stood on your head and looked at it upside down, it would still look exactly the same because your brain is so capable at attributing meaning and the, the, the experience that you get will reflect meaning. We did an experiment that, that relates to vision and how different information gives us meaning. Uh, we got a whole group of people who described themselves as normal individuals, but they did volunteer for a pain experiment. <laughs> They're probably not normal. Um, we should really say this, was, this experiment was done in a group of psychologically questionable, <laughs> poverty-stricken students. <laughs> but we, in each situation, just, just think about what we did here. This is a very cold probe that goes on the back of their hand. And we, didn't, we did not tell them it was cold. We just told them it was a, it was a probe and there might be different temperatures of the probe. Uh, and then we showed them, at the same time, either a red light, because, it, because red means hot and danger. Or for some of the, the trials, so some of these stimuli, we showed them a blue light. And blue means safety and cool. For every single stimulus they got, the probe was always the same temperature, real temperature. It was always minus 20 degrees, which is very cold, but not particularly dangerous for more than a, a few seconds. We asked them a lot of questions, but this is what they responded when we asked them about pain. So we said, did that hurt? And if it did, how much did it hurt? And you can see how much we rely on this horrible zero to 10 scale that you all hate. Each line belongs to a person. Each person got, I think, about 10 different stimuli in each condition. And the fact that all of these lines, well, not all of them, most of them tend to go up in that direction, tells us that for, for nearly all of these supposedly normal people, the same stimulus with a red light hurts more than it does with a blue light because of the meaning. We've changed meaning. Now, you can see this person here, uh, this person here, they're idiots. <laughs> they don't, they don't, um, they don't, they, their brain doesn't process that meaning, or perhaps they were colorblind. Who knows? <laughs> we know that the ability of the system to detect danger ramps up rapidly and massively in the presence of inflammation. So, this is why inflammation, inflamed joints, hurt. This is one reason they hurt so much more. Uh, here's a, this is an advertisement for an English DJ who is coming out to get sunburnt in Australia. Um, sunburn is inflammation of the skin and you've probably all been sunburnt and when that warm water goes on your skin it really hurts. And that's because of the, the shift in this protective buffer. You've moved from a, a normal sized buffer to a really big buffer. And that is a beautiful system to stop you putting forces through those tissues that need to heal. And it's very effective. Back to if you've twisted your ankle. The day after you've twisted your ankle and you can't put any weight on it, there's no way your ankle is in true danger, but the system knows, I want to be overly protective while we heal. And inflammation has that effect, and we understand very well how it has that effect. We understand the mechanisms. We understand some ways that we can interrupt that effect. One of the challenges that faces anyone with persisting pain is that our pain system learns. It's a rapid learner. It's an effective learner. We, we know a lot about how it learns. The, the really difficult part of this whole biology of the human is that it learns really well. Uh, the way that I would describe this scenario to uh, people, so I spent the first 15 years of my clinical life running pain education classes for people doing a pain management program through a hospital. Uh, and I would tell them this story, uh, which is based on my experience travelling around Australia trying to learn how to play the clarinet. 
and a saxophone. And I was hitchhiking and I was waiting out the back of a roadhouse in Northern Territory and someone stopped and shouted out from the, their ute, do you want a job, mate? And I thought I'd been discovered as a, as a clarinet player. <laughs> I thought that person had heard me and thought, he's good. And I jumped in the ute and I said, where's the job? And he said, well, we need someone to drive trucks around our property in northern Western Australia. So we drove for 20 hours and we got to his property and then my job was literally sitting in the front of a, of a truck that when you got to 80 kilometres an hour, it just drove itself. You just pressed a little green button on the dashboard and it would stay at 80 kilometres an hour and you just had to keep an eye on things. And I drove for eight hours in one property. But I practised one tune the whole time. And that tune was called Ornithology by Charlie Parker. Does anyone, anyone know Charlie Parker? Anyone know Ornithology? Please don't tell everyone how bad this is, but Ornithology goes a little bit like this. Was it okay? Yeah, great. I'll do it again because you need to remember the sound. One more time. That's ornithology. And I played ornithology non-stop, eight hours a day for three weeks, driving through the desert, sitting sideways in a truck with my elbow on the steering wheel and my back resting against the... You know that thing on the, um, on the door for your arm that hurts your back when your back's on it for a while? <laughs> now, I know everyone who's nodding has been kissing in the car. <laughs> I saw you, you're a vigorous nodder. <laughs> so that thing that uh, I was there, to cut a very long story slightly shorter, about, about three months later, I was playing in a five-piece jazz band in King's Cross in Sydney. Uh, and we were very, very good. We played the 1 a.m. till 3 a.m. shift on Monday mornings. <laughs> and we had a singer, uh, uh, there was someone in the club who was a, a gospel singer from the, from the States, and she said, can I do some tunes with you? I said, sure, what should we start with? And we started with Amazing Grace. And she was amazing. She really was. She had this voice like chocolate and uh, she did a bit of soloing, then it went to the band leader on the double bass and did the soloing. And I'd made my way around. If anyone had ever been to a club called Round Midnight in King's Cross, you'll remember that there was an old Dodge truck prop. And I made my way there. I was on the saxophone, not the clarinet. And I sat with my legs out and my elbow resting against the steering wheel and my back on that thing <laughs> and my sunglasses on playing Amazing Grace. And it came to my solo, and this is what happened. <laughs> I was in ornithology, in the middle of Amazing Grace. And I looked over at the band leader, and he was doing this. He was going. <laughs> and, and I remember looking at my fingers, part scared, part impressed that they were going so fast, and mouthing back at him as I was playing, I mouthed back. I got sacked from that band. But that experience is, is exactly what happens in your brain when, you, when your brain keeps playing the pain tune. It gets so good at it that it can hijack amazing grace. <laughs> so you might have days where, you, you, where you, you're doing the same thing you've always done. And one day, bang, you've done nothing different. And you are struck down by terrifying, distressing pain that, that has got you. Does anyone relate to that? Now, if we don't understand pain, we should conclude you're in a catastrophically 
a structurally catastrophic situation. But because we understand pain, we can now say something has caused this flare up and it's overprotective. Your tissues are not really in threat because you've done this task, you, 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 your structure knows how to do it, but something has made ornithology hijack amazing grace. And the system learns pain so well that what you can do pain free just goes lower and lower and lower. So you, you sort of have two choices. Well, you've got three, but the two that are the most common choices are that you start avoiding that pain because that's the system, it's working, or you try to beat it. Think which system you use of those two. Do you just slowly avoid it more and more? And if you do that, you would have noticed over years you're getting more and more disabled by your pain. It's affecting more and more of your life. It's getting triggered by things that are unrelated to your body. Loud noises set it off. You're getting irritable. You get sick and your pain comes back. If you're doing the, the approach, I'm just going to beat it, exactly the same scenario happens because it is you. It's you, it's your brain that's producing pain, so you can't beat it, it's you. Fortunately, there's a third way. And that's the most, for me, the most exciting thing that I've learned in 25 years of pain science is the third way of retraining the overprotective system that's learned how to produce pain. The challenge that anyone faces with persistent pain is that their pain is overly protective. You are overprotected. The irony is that your tissues are safer and they feel way less safe. And this situation, this loyal friend that, that, that would have saved the life of my schoolmate had, had his system worked, this loyal friend has become like a, a raging beast that's controlling your life. It's stopping you from doing stuff. It's changing who you are. We now get excited by these realities. That learning in the pain system, man, and this might not apply to you at all, but if you've got persistent pain, you might recognise the stories that I've told. Learning in the pain system got you into this mess and learning can get you out. We now know there's a building body of evidence there's a really strong scientific argument that when we train the system, it is possible to, and the, and the, the phrase that we use, it is, it is possible to tame the beast again, to bring your system into being appropriately protective. Now, if your tissues are actually in danger, if you have an inflammatory disease, if you have some uh, musculoskeletal trauma, is unresolved, then it, it's sensible to have some pain to be able to protect you. But so far, we, as a pain science community, we, we can't see any possibility of you having persistent pain and your system not learning. If you're human, it will have learned. So you will be more protected than you need to be. And that is a really confronting and uh, disappointing message in some ways on its own. But right next to that message is that therefore things can be better than they are. Absolutely. So the pain science revolution offers hope. I think it offers genuine, uh, realisable hope. But there's a catch. Unfortunately there's a catch this is the hope. Outstanding outcomes, including recovery for many people, are possible. Definitely possible. The data tell us this, the science predicts this. The catch is that it takes time and it takes effort. And it takes a whole lot of characteristics that everyone who would come this evening has. You just got to employ them and get a coach to help you employ them. So this is what the pain science revolution suggests that we, we should be promoting in the, in the health field about 
how to, how to improve your life when you have persistent pain. The first, and I think the most challenging, is rethinking pain. Shifting your idea of pain as being a measure of the state of the tissues. Shifting it into being something your brain's doing to protect you, and therefore everything matters. So now we have to understand your amazing protector meter, this system inside you that is always judging how much to, it should, you should be protecting yourself. This is out of a book that I wrote that you really should all buy. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, th this is an idea of what we call the protector meter. And on one side of this are all the things in your life that tell your brain your system is in danger and needing protecting. Everything in your life. Messages from the tissues, messages from your friends, your partner, your kids, your health professional, the things you say, the things you do, the things you hear. I saw a patient uh, some time ago now, but, but he called himself Roman, even though his name was Norman. And I said, do you want me to call you Roman or Norman? He said, call me Roman, everyone calls me Roman. All right, well, I mean, why? Have you seen my x-ray? I said, what? His lumbar spine, his low back x-ray, was described as having degenerative changes, which were actually very normal for someone of, of his age. But he, he likened them to the Roman ruins. And that became part of who he was. And that's sort of a bit funny, right? But it's tragic, actually because his entire identity was one big, what we would describe as a DIM, which stands for danger in me. His name, every time he said it, people talked to him, just told his brain, your back's in danger. A little reminder, your back's in danger. And a smart brain should just work a little bit harder to protect his back. And if, you, if your brain's working hard to protect your back, the best way to do it, make your back hurt, give you back pain, lock up your back, stop it from moving, stop you moving, reduce your balance, make you feel a bit sick if it has to, it will protect. On the other side of this is what we call SIMS. So evidence to your brain that of safety in me, not danger in me, safety in me. And the protector meter, our internal protector meter is, is in a constant state of judging DIMS and SIMS. The challenge that anyone with persistent pain has. And I would probably argue anyone with pain that's not following the ideal trajectory of recovery. The challenge is identifying what are my dims? And what are my sims? How can I find them? And we have a phrase that we use with people in pain which, which says, dims and sims hide in difficult to spot places. You've got to go looking for them. This is a version, uh, I apologise for this really amateur slide, but this was me on a reasonably bumpy flight from Adelaide today. This is capturing uh, what, what's been around for 50 years, it's called the biopsychosocial model of health, uh, and I'm saying protection. Things that are bio relate to the true health of the tissues of your body, including genetics and danger messages and things like that. The psycho, refers to the things that you know, your thoughts, your beliefs, other feelings that you're having, your fears, your mood. Of course, none of this applies, if you have pain, none of this applies if you're not a human. And the reason I keep saying that is that it's very common for people to think, yeah, well, my, pain, my pain's different. My, pain, my pain's all about that. And I would say, well, if that is truly the case, then you are not a human. Or you're the first human ever discovered who doesn't have this contribution to pain. Social refers to your relationships, your community, your culture, your, your access to care. And pain sits at the middle. I think my mark has got to stop working. And that stopped working. Oh, okay, everyone, we've got here the Citrix receiver. 
is telling us, oh, hang on. <laughs> Tell you, I have a natural IT guy. <laughs> Pain sits at the, at the intersection of these three things in every human. And the dims that we have, evidence of danger in me, and the sims that we can find, evidence of safety in me, can be found in all of those places. Therefore, the pain science revolution says, well, if you can, if you can rethink pain, it's a really hard thing to do, and you, and you might need to really learn a lot about pain to do that. Then you can re-engage re with the idea of retraining your system, teaching your system, to be less protective, teaching your pain system to be less protective. I think the first thing you need is understanding. And, and I bet that among you there are people who are thinking, no, nah, this is not me. My pain's different. I bet you there are people among you who are thinking, well, this makes a lot of sense, but I don't really understand. I'd like to understand more. Uh, and MSK is ready for you. There are a lot of resources around. And there are some of you, I imagine, who are thinking, oh, I've heard this before, he's saying it's all in my head. And you're contemplating the fuck off posture. <laughs> Pain is clearly in your body. But 100% of the time, without exception, it's produced by your brain. No brain, no pain. I used to, a long time ago, I worked with a rugby union club, and I think some of them, there might be an exception to that rule, but <laughs> I think you need understanding, and this is something that, that is hard to get, but there are a lot of resources now out there to help you gain an understanding of it. You need to plan, okay, how am I going to go about this? You need patience, because it's usually slow, although you might just be surprised that it's faster than you think. You need persistence because it's a journey. This system has learnt and has adapted to protect you. It's going to need some convincing to reduce that protective buffer. <laughs> you will need courage, but in my experience, people with persistent pain are some of the most courageous people I've ever met. And you'll often need a good coach. So that's a good clinician who understands modern pain science, who understands high value care, who treats you with respect and who gives you the resources to master your situation. And the third thing to remember, motion is lotion. <laughs> Active stuff gradually suppresses the pain system by many mechanisms. Passive stuff, getting stuff done to you, doesn't. Active stuff protects you against a whole lot of other problems that we know are, elev are of, of increased risk when you have persistent pain. Passive doesn't protect you like that. In an overprotective system, movement is safe even when it is a bit painful. Avoiding movement is not. In an overprotected system, the risk of inactivity is much greater than the risk of activity. And if you can lock those things away, and you go little by little, always do more today than you did yesterday, but not much more. Retrain your system, don't try to beat it. So this journey back to life, we put it to the survey, and the survey says, everyone agrees, everyone who's in this, in this game agrees this is the way to go about it. It's not everyone, sorry. All of these official bodies agree, and there are more, but there are portions of the community who don't, and I imagine the more you stand to lose by adopting this model, the less likely you are to endorse it. This is what I've said, pain is a lifesaver. Pain and injury have a variable relationship. Pain is all about protecting our tissues. Danger messages matter, but not as much as what they mean our pain system learns. Modern science offers hope with a catch. And the hope is 
Life can be better, for sure. The catch is, not without work. Not without time. Not without training. Rethink your pain. Try and understand your internal, your internal protective meter. Re-engage your system to retrain it. Get all the help you need to retrain it, to go on that journey. And remember that motion is lotion. Here's some places you can go. So obviously, go to msk.org.au. They've got this great booklet. It was great to see that this is given to all of you. That's fantastic. Pain Revolution is an initiative that I'm involved with. Um, we've got resources for, for the general public there, things that you can read, you can watch YouTube clips, those sorts of things. Uh, if you're really rich, you could support us by donating. Uh, it, only if you've got money left after supporting MSK Australia. <laughs> TameTheBeast.org is centred around an animation. This is a pretty embarrassing animated me. Uh, but trying to re just reinforce some of the stuff that I've said tonight. And again, there's resources on there for you. Uh, I'd like to just say, uh, again, thank you for having me. But um, really, thank you for you guys for, for making the effort to come out and doing this for yourselves. Uh, but also doing this for the community of practice. I know there are clinicians in here, uh, and part of my job is to keep clinicians accountable to science and to evidence. Uh, and without you guys engaging in the process, that's going to be a lot harder to do. So thank you very much. And the last thing that I do... <laughs>